Thanks very much, Sis, and um, welcome, uh, colleagues, to Washington, D.C. It's a beautiful day out there. Uh, I think uh, more recently it's been like my hometown, London, rather gray and wet. Um, but uh, it's very good to be amongst you, and thanks very much to the Africa Center uh, for inviting me down. Um, and to really examine this uh, quite important um, but let, let's really sort of interrogate it, this nexus between development, development institutions such as my own, the World Bank, and uh, the ones that, that uh, you represent in terms of uh, military police and, and other forces. Um, I did not have the privilege of, of listening to Neil's presentation, so I hope there's not too much of an overlap. But what I would like to do um, is very briefly interrogate this nexus um, between security and de development um, to see how it plays out in practice. Um, and then secondly, to raise with you a number of examples of how a large development institution, the World Bank, uh, engages in the security arena and particularly works with uh, people such as yourselves, uh, governments on national security. Um, which is not uh, a normal area of work for the World Bank, but um, is increasing over time. So, as, as we all know, the security development nexus sort of entered the policy arena in the 1990s um, and was very much associated with a seminal report put out by the UN in 1994, which looked at human security and looked at the interplay between human security, human safety, uh, and protection from fear and physical threat, and other types of security, such as food security, job security, which are very much associated with the development arena. The other thing about the 1990s was in the post-Cold War era, you increasingly had development actors uh, intervening in uh, crisis countries. Um, because the old veto between uh, the USSR and the, and the US had ended. Um, so you saw countries like the Somalias, the former Yugoslavia, um, Rwanda, where development institutions were actually present in conflict zones. You also had a development of peacekeeping and peacebuilding doctrine, and uh, particularly from the Europeans, the whole concept of whole of government thinking. Uh, whereby security actors sat down with diplomats as well as development practitioners. So it's from a number of trends uh, that this term, security development nexus, really began to stick. However, it's not always been well accepted. Uh, I'll just give two examples. Uh, one is uh, by uh, summarized by an academic, David Chandler, who wrote the piece in 2007, The Security Development Nexus and the Rise of Anti-Foreign Policy. And he looked at particularly European foreign policy, um, and he saw the security development nexus very much as this sort of self-referential way in which Western states would talk about this nexus but very much in rhetorical terms, but not in real practical terms of which were then implemented, which then were actually realized in tackling big security development challenges in the developing world. So he saw it as a, as a bit of a paper tiger. Um, and, and that's something that we, we can certainly interrogate ourselves. The second critique is by those... Um, who saw that development finance, official development finance, uh, was being manipulated for security objectives. Um, the so-called term is the securitization of development. So, ostensibly, development is there in order to reduce poverty, promote growth, and in the long term, promote, obviously, the trade between nations. So, there is a degree of self-interest in there. Um, but the critique is that increasingly development has been focused very much in line with certain states' um, security agendas. And, and the proof in that is that although there has been a large increase of development assistance to developing countries, uh, 
uh, over time, over the last 15 years, particularly to those that, countries that are affected by fragility and conflict. But the largest two recipients have been Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and so the, the critiques of this nexus have said, yeah, but um, this is an example of how, how development aid has been skewed. But we can examine it um, in a number of ways, and I, I think that the evidence is fairly telling that there is obviously uh, an inextricable link. And the question is, how is it useful for you? Um, so firstly, I think it's useful in just general terms that insecurity is clearly an impediment to development. And the World Development Report published by the World Bank in 2011 uh, set out the evidence quite well that those countries um, over a span of, of 20 years that were in peace had made massive strides in reducing poverty from something like 60-65% down to 30-35%. However, those countries that remained in conflict, the numbers of those in poverty stayed at around 60%. None of the Millennium Development Goals that were set for 2015 uh, were achieved in fragile countries. And some more specifics, um, for example, urban crime and violence in El Salvador is meant to cost something like 16% of GDP. Civil war costs in an average medium-sized development country costs the, the equivalent of 30 years of GDP growth. So the evidence is out there that insecurity violence is a great block on uh, normal development objectives. However, the, the, the little caveat I have to say here is that historically, state formation has always been associated with conflict and violence. Um, and the academic Tilly has been very much advancing uh, that theory that if you look at the, the history of Europe, the history of the USA, for example, it's, it's been one which hasn't necessarily been peaceful all the time. So I think one needs to be careful about this association between the two. The second is, is that underdevelopment certainly does lead to insecurity and conflict. Um, and is very much part and parcel of the analysis of the causes of conflict and violence. At the individual level, the, the risk factors associated with an individual actually joining in and participating in violence are indeed associated with poverty, lack of education, lack of life chances, and unemployment. However, those, those structural factors at the national level level, the evidence is certainly less clear. Uh, for example, the question about those countries with higher or lower unemployment rates, it's very mixed. It's, it's very difficult to say, oh, because a country has a high unemployment rate, it's going to fall into conflict. That evidence does not exist. And then there are other, as you know, um, other ways, other, other perspectives to look at the, the whole question of, of uh, what is uh, the cause of conflict? For example, the access to rentable resources such as oil, such as diamonds, gold, the degree to which certain populations are excluded from uh, economic growth, vertical inequality, horizontal inequality. So these are aspects to do with the very basis of how a country develops over time. What the World Development, Re World Development Report of 2011 really helped us was that it made a shift in the traditional thinking, which was that conflict and violence was associated with low income. Um, and there was this thinking that if a country was low income, then it was immediately prone to conflict. And what the WDR of 2011 shifted was to really look at the role of institutions, and particularly weak institutions, in managing conflict risks. And really, what we're talking about here is institutions as rules of the game and shared values, 
which are transacted or enforced by organizations. Those organizations can either sit within the state or outside the state. And political and criminal violence correlate strongly with weak and predatory institutions. And so what we've seen is that although the general trend is of a reduction in formalized, organized conflict over time, that there has been an uptick um, in civil war, and that civil wars can occur in middle-income countries as they can in low-income countries. And so no longer do we say that the association between low-income and conflict is necessarily a strong one, um, and there is the shift more to ideas around and thinking around institutions and governance. And so the focus is on how to build strong national institutions particularly to provide security, justice, and jobs. Then there's another third way in which uh, the security development nexus is, is interesting to, to examine, and that is where development is an instrument which may actually cause insecurity. And this comes from the, the literature and the experience whereby external intervention has been seen to perpetuate conflict and violence. This is the work of people like Mary Anderson, David Keane, Alex DeWall. This is more focused on humanitarian aid and the role in which food, for example, food distributions or drugs um, can, can support uh, armed groups, but also equally applies to development finance. Um, and the other aspect is the way in which armed groups, security forces, exact a rent uh, and therefore profit from providing protection. There's another strand which looks at the way in which aid um, supports counterinsurgency. And some studies, for example, in the Philippines have shown that near the front lines of uh, an insurgency, aid, for example, distributed at the community level, actually increases the likelihood of violence. And then there's a third strand to this, which is the increasing look at corruption, um, grand scale corruption, which is seen as a major source of insecurity. Corruption, including that of development finance. And this is particularly uh, highlighted in the work of Sarah Chase and her work on, on Afghanistan. So I think what this third strand tells us is, is that development actors really need to be very careful in how they engage in insecure environments. And then the last strand of, of the nexus, uh, before I touch upon in a little bit more detail the work of the World Bank, is how development aid has increasingly been used for security objectives with more or less positive outcomes. The first dates back to um, the village pacification programs in, in Viet Vietnam and the use of aid to win hearts and minds. As I've said, the evidence on that is, is still mixed on the degree to which the provision of basic services, of basic infrastructure, can win populations over to your side, but it's still very much um, at the forefront of much engagement by agencies in these kinds of settings. Another example is the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration programs, where development finance is used to reintegrate ex-combatants back into civilian life. So just as, a, as an aside, the World Bank has spent something like $1.2 billion in the last 10 years in DDR operations in Africa, with some good, some bad results. I think very much contingent on uh, victory settlements, uh, where compared to negotiated settlements. Victory settlements where one side is the winner, for example, in Rwanda, in Angola, in Ethiopia, which has complete control uh, and monopoly on the means of violence. 
Negotiated settlements are much more problematic. Um, and then the last aspect of, of the way in which development aid is, has proved in a very macro sense to support security objectives is the work of Andy Mack. Uh, and now the, it's no longer with us, the Human Security Report. Um, and the evidence in terms of how peacekeeping, peacebuilding, and reconstruction aid generally has supported, contributed to the, the general reduction in, in violence and insecurity around the world. So that concludes the first half of the way in which this nexus can be unpicked and in certain circumstances can be useful for you in trying to understand the relationships between development as an instrument, development as an outcome, and the role of, of security actors. And that that nexus may be both positive and negative. It's not always to see it as a, as a, as a good thing. What I'd like to turn to now is the role of the World Bank specifically in and some of the work that we do in helping governments look at national security policy, national security strategy, and the shape and composition of their forces. Um, this comes from the general principle, um, which was certainly highlighted in the work on financing for development. And there's a paper out there called From Billions to Trillions, which recognized that the, the key to national development is not external aid, is not remittances, um, but is really on increasing domestic resources, particularly through legitimate institutions, which then provide public goods. And so the key is, how can states use their resources effectively and efficiently for particular objectives, whether it be education, health, or in our case here, for security objectives? And so within this broad principle, the, the World Bank has been, been working with a number of governments over the last 10 years to help examine these very questions around the efficiency, effectiveness, affordability of the security and justice, particularly the criminal justice sector. We've used a particular instrument called the Public Expenditure Review, which we've used for other sectors, such as education and health, but adapted it for the security sector. And I'll just give three examples of that work uh, before finishing, uh, looking at Liberia, uh, Somalia, and the Central African Republic. So in Liberia in 2012, the, the government requested the UN and the bank to assess its uh, national security policy, particularly in light of the pending uh, drawdown of UNMIL and the degree to which the state could supersede or replace the security and criminal justice functions that uh, since the Ghana, um, the Accra Accord had been fulfilled by the United Nations. The focus was on internal security. We did not look at the army. And the focus particularly was on the strategy, the strategic ob objective of providing five regional hubs uh, within uh, the country to, in a sense, be a one-stop shop for policing and judicial functions. We calculated with the government that the cost of that program would be 700, something like 700 million over five years, including the payroll of the police services, the capital investment required, and operational recurrent costs. And within that 700 million, we calculated something like 175 million was a fiscal gap. In other words, that could not be afforded by the government itself. And therefore, the, the review was used to go to donors to say, could you fill this financial gap? Plus, um, with efficiencies... Uh, with savings which could be made by better budgeting, um, by much better use of uh, payroll registration, um, 
that amount could be met by the government. Now, since then, um, more recently, the government of Liberia has come for an update. They've uh, constructed, as I understand, two regional hubs, um, but not gone for the whole plan of five. Um, and the question is, to assess the deployment of that strategy uh, to date, what resources are available and what fine-tuning can be made, um, and particularly are those hubs, are the forces that are deployed within Liberia fit for purpose? In other words, contending with the challenges associated with public order uh, inside the country. Um, and so we have, we have agreed with the government to try and do something before the election cycle or perhaps to do something which, which will be useful for an incoming, com incoming government by the end of this year. Turning to Somalia in 2013, uh, the federal government there requested again the World Bank to lead a review of the security sector with the UN. That arose out of two concerns. One was a concern on the government side by the ad hoc nature in which um, certain foreign partners, external partners, were providing stipends to um, militias and armed forces in the fight against the insurgency, the Al-Shabaab. And secondly, on the international partner side, there were real concerns about the affordability and sustainability of the security sector and security architecture which was being created by the federal government. We have been working with the government for over three years um, and including the emerging federal states in Somalia and we've had a number of very high-level interactions. Um, they have a, a, a donor high-level uh, partners forum uh, which was last held in Ankara where we, we, we um, presented this work as well as at the, the United Nations Security Council. The work really has focused on, on two tensions. The tension of trying to fight a counterinsurgency, to lead a counterinsurgency, increasingly take over from the Africa Union force Amazon. And secondly, to exit a war to peace transition. A war to peace transition in which there are many armed men uh, with access to, to small arms and what to do uh, with such a large presence, uh, such a large degree of militarization. And so though those have um, contradicting uh, tendencies, in other words, to fight a, a counterinsurgency, uh, the tendency is for better policing, greater policing, not necessarily a military force. Um, and in a war, war to peace transition, states um, such as in Burundi, such as in South Sudan, have faced enormous payroll demands as increasing numbers of, of uh, our men have come on, on the public payroll. So to cut a long story short, what we've presented to the Somali authorities is three scenarios, one with a very small agile army, one uh, and including a, a greater police force, and then the the third scenario is a large army which accounts for the integration of the militia forces uh, onto the public payroll. And the idea is to match those scenarios um, with the availability of state resources. And clearly it's quite, quite obvious that the Somali state cannot afford the kind of security architecture that it aspires to. It's not for us, the UN or the bank, to say what kind of security architecture it should, should have, but it uses the public finance perspective to put options on the table uh, for decision makers um, to take. Um, and then the last example I came back from uh, Bangui last week was uh, is the Central Africa Republic, where we're in the process of uh, looking at, again, very much these questions of what the Central African Republic can afford in terms of a quite a large military, 
It has uh, the FACA of about 8,500 and a very small police. And essentially at the moment, it has no functioning budget. So um, all, all the budget, all the security budget is taken up in terms of salaries. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a security architecture that exists but does not function. And so the question is, what is affordable for the government to do? Um, can it downsize in certain areas, for example, the military, and can it upsize in other areas, for, for example, the police? What is the function of those forces um, and the degree to which they could deploy throughout the territory to provide protection to, to citizens? So those are the questions that we will be interrogating over the next six months. And again, a bit like in the Somalia case, we will come up with options, scenarios, costing scenarios, um, with which the key stakeholders in Bangui can, can use to think through what options they have as they go through a security sector reform process. These examples have been very much built upon uh, a, a very strong relationship with the Department of Peacekeeping uh, in New York. And their interest is really this one of transition. In other words, where you have a large peacekeeping force and it reduces in size the degree to which the state can take over those functions. But we've also worked in other countries such as Mexico, Philippines, uh, middle-income countries which are at peace but really want to look at this question of effectiveness and performance and whether ministries of finance, ministries of interior, ministries of defense are getting the best value of, of, of money. Um, and, and that's, uh, I'll conclude by sort of reinforcing that point that what we're not wanting to do is to look at security as a zero-sum game. In other words, it's money that could be used for something else it's more helping governments um, use their resources more effectively, help them look at ways in which to modernize their forces in order to provide better security for their citizens. Mr. Chair, I will conclude there. Thanks very much.